Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm Sydney Jones, and I just hit my microphone, and this is Liz. We're here to talk about external partnerships and how an information sharing and analysis center can work with its members to improve the entire sector's defense. Um, so here's our agenda. I'll kick us off. So as I said, I'm Sydney Jones, and I really wanted to give this talk with my FSISAC colleague today because external partnerships and information sharing has always been important to me. I started off in the DC area as a government intelligence analyst and also doing cyber policy. And I learned then just even within the intelligence community, how important these information sharing partnerships are. Um, within the Department of Defense, you're trying to share amongst each other when you're out there on the battlefield, when you're within the intel community as well, you're trying to share for the government at large. Um, but then even when I moved into the private sector, it's also important to remember that, you know, there's so much more out there that we're doing on behalf of our country besides just defending it. So these partnerships that I've been able to uh, make and build over time have been very important to me. So I'll pass it off to Liz. Hi, I'm Liz McAlpine Geary. I was a member of the United States intelligence community with multiple agencies for about 20 years. Um, and I think when I really became attracted to the idea of protecting critical infrastructure was when I was at the FBI. And we worked in 2016 on the Russia election influ uh, influence campaign. And it became very clear that the United States government could not have the answers until the private sector came. And in this case, the social media companies came and they really told us exactly what the Russians were doing. And we never would have known without their input and to really understand the totality of what was going on with the Russian election interference. And that's really what led me to learning more about ISACs in general, and then to FSISAC. So a little bit about our ISAC. Does anyone know about your sector? Does anyone know if your firm is, is part of an ISAC? Oh, oh, good. Okay, just out of curiosity, what ISAC? Okay, excellent. Health, healthcare. Ah, retail hospitality, a lot of overlap with FSISAC. Um, really interesting, if you don't know, 85% of critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. So in order for us to secure the country, the private sector has to be secure. Uh, and really interesting uh, how we go about doing it at FSISAC. And we're very diverse, um, as you are. And you're all part of the financial sector. All of you bank, probably have a mortgage, probably have a, a credit card. I have a Target red card. Target is one of our board of directors. Why? Because Target funds all their own credit card. They finance their own credit card. Ford finances their own vehicles. Harley Davidson finances their own vehicles. Your healthcare company is actually an asset management company. You're giving them money. They're managing your assets to order to pay you out. They're not, they're not actually really a healthcare company. So it's kind of interesting. We're all part of this sector. So I hope you feel, even though this is FSI SAC, you feel included in this. Um, and how we like to do it is because like, likes like, right? So at FSI SAC, we take the different subsectors, mortgage companies, um, insurance companies, securities and investment firms are heavily regulated, retail banks, heavily regulated, and we give them their own community of interest so they can feel comfortable. And one thing I've learned as I survived in this, uh, in this cyber threat environment is to get to the ones and the zeros that you need to protect yourself, you have to actually use soft skills. You have to actually build trust with the other firms before you can even get to that boutique, interesting threat intelligence that's gonna make us all more secure. So that's something that I've learned later in life. Um, and how you do that is you try to create communities where there's some initial trust already, um, companies that, you know, peers that you already are in the same sort of struggle with. And then we'll also have communities with topics, right? Fraud, um, cyber threat intelligence, uh, business continuity. We've been getting hit with a lot of ransomware lately in the financial sector, so business continuity is important, right? We've, we're, we're there. We're at the point of disruption. Um, so, and then we set up um, overlapping communities of interest so that we can all share best practices, especially with our small and medium firms that don't have the benefit of these large CTI teams. Um, and really quickly, how do we do that? 
just want to go to the next slide, um, is we set aside some rules, right? Some rules of engagement, so to speak, when we create these communities of interest. And one of the ways we do it is we set criteria. If you want to be part of the cyber threat intelligence and share that boutique threat intelligence, you're going to have to share it. So Sydney, do you want to go? We can talk a little bit about what we do. And one of the things we do is we require them to submit an application and then eight different members um, from large firms look at the applications and we don't necessarily look at the firm. So if you're from Bank of Goliath and you have the best CTI team in the whole world, but none of your members are sharing with an FSI SAC, you don't get to join. That's true. And then uh, a lot of times their leadership at Bank of Goliath says, well, why can't they join? And then we use public shaming, which is a very effective tool. <laughs> in the, and we say, well, your peers don't want you in this trusted circle until you can prove that you can share, right? All of this soft skill stuff is going on. Public shaming, <laughs> trust building, you know, um, like meets like, so you can be with your own tribe. But ultimately, what we want to do is build the trust necessary to get to the point where you can actually share the ones and zeros. So, Oh, really quickly, um, this is just goes to show you the kind of um, threats we're under. Our members represent $100 trillion in assets. One clearinghouse uh, clears $7 trillion a day. Um, one clearinghouse moves the entire GDP through their organization every five days. It's no fail. It truly is. I mean, when you hear that press reports of people running around with USB drives, well, hey, this is a no-fail mission, folks. You know, <laughs> we're going to have to do what we have to do to keep this, keep this, the financial sector running, the economy running, and all of you able to access your money. Um, so I always like to point that out. Huge target on our backs with this kind of assets, and but our intelligence exchange, what we operate is. Uh, channels that are behind VPNs with multi-factor uh, um, authentication. Jen Easterly set me up to say MFA today uh, to, to, so that you can get behind a trusted sharing platform so you can share behind a VPN. Um, and so we have about 22,000 active users. Okay, and now I'll talk about why myself at the bank I'm at is a member. Um, I've actually been a member of FSI SAC through three different institutions now, and all three of them kind of vary on why they're members, but for the most part, it's these partnerships that we've discussed. We've talked about the real-time intelligence sharing that we have. Um, there's a portal within FSI SAC that we share. There's various listservs in these communities. There's also a, a chat feature that we use, especially when we're dealing with an incident in the sector. Um, and then there's also the expertise that we're able to share. And as Sierra mentioned earlier, there's also the people that care about us. Um, so, you know, the regulators who kind of wish that we would be part of an information sharing organization. So that's another big reason why we were a part of the FSI SAC. Um, so for myself, the reasons why, you know, I still promote this and why I think it's important, regardless of what sector you're in, to be part of your ISAC is that real-time sharing and those soft skills. You know, we're here at this conference, we're getting to know each other, meeting new, meeting new friends, seeing old friends, and those partnerships are really what is going to allow us to continue to share and encourage us to share. We're not going to share indicators with people we don't know. Um, we're not going to share anything that we've seen on our environment, again, with people we don't know because we aren't sure if we can trust them. Um, and the ISAC does allow us that ability to meet in person, to meet in these even community groups within our regions. Um, and then also provides us anonymization when we're sharing something on the portal as well. So it's not coming back to us. Another few things that we like is that, you know, it is a global organization. I work at a very large global bank and I have CTI teams that I partner with in EMEA and APAC. And they're also able to work with their FSI SAC partners that are based in those regions. So we have that real time information sharing around the clock. So whether I'm at work or not, I know that my team is able to talk to other members. So all this sounds great. Um, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, my legal team or whatever management team does not want me to share information. Um, 
which makes sense. I, I've recently gone through similar things at my last two firms and kind of helped them start an information sharing process and procedure. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys some tips on how you can do that and how you can develop this within your own team and firm. Um, so first is just kind of start sharing the information that you're getting from your ISAC. You know, explain and demonstrate what the information is that you're getting, that it is indicators, it is threat information, kind of show them it doesn't have the firm that submitted this information on that report. So you're really just getting the threat information. And kind of also share that you're not planning on sharing anything related to PII, PHI, MNPI, anything that's sensitive to your firm. So just kind of fill in the blank for what is good for your sector for that. And just kind of explain like we do plan on, you know, removing the information related to the receiver email address, which would be your firm, you know, any names that are associated with your firm, et cetera, how you're gonna non-attribute what you're sharing. And then also kind of explain the benefits that you are getting from this. You got this information about a phishing campaign and your incident response team was able to prevent the same phishing campaign from hitting your organization or causing an impact. You know, during an incident that we've had several in this past year that we'll talk about in a couple slides, how we're able to share that information across our business resiliency teams and share those, you know, what we are all learning as best practices. And then also just, you know, the normal CTI shares that we have day to day, those are also important. So when you kind of are able to start demonstrating those things that you're getting, then you're sharing that with all your teams, you write it down, you're going to explain how you plan on going about the process of sharing the threat information you are seeing, circulate that with these teams that you've just had all these discussions with so they can see what it looks like on paper. And then also talk about how you plan on tracking what it is that you share externally, because that's another big thing. They wanna know what all did you actually share out? Um, and then also one thing I wanted to note was the Intelligence and National Security Alliance did actually just post a paper on Thursday about this process. So I will put it in the Slack channel after this talk. Um, so that also will provide you know, some great tangential examples of how to do this. And really quickly about the information sharing with firms, it's something you can do as the leadership of your firm's competitive nature is you can compare, you can compare yourself to someone else and say, you know, we're, we're sharing as much as these other peers in our subsectors because um, nobody, you know, everybody in this competitive business wants to be, they don't want to share, but then they don't want to be caught not sharing if everyone else is sharing, right? So you get to you <laughs> you get to to really kind of work that competitive loop for them. And we do maintain very um, well. We don't uh, strict metrics. So while other firms don't know um, how much, let's say Sydney's firm shares, she's able to pull her metrics to show her leadership how much they share, and and they're able to, you know, gain value from that. Okay, so we have at least three incidents we could discuss from the past year. One started at uh, the same time as this conference last year. So three big vendors in the financial space were hit with ransomware, the LockBit variant. Um, so ION was hit last January, ICBC a couple of months ago, and Equilend was last week. So these are things that we had not, I don't know about you, Liz, but I'd never heard of them before these incidents. So let's talk through, you know, what, did FSI say do in each of these situations and some things that we've learned together? Okay, one of the ones I think for, um, I'll just go back to the industrial Chinese, industrial commercial bank of China, largest bank in the world, operates a small, um, a small affiliate in New York that trades primary US treasuries. Well, I didn't realize but if that market gets disrupted, that is how the United States government funds itself. It is a no-fail mission. If they cannot trade primary U.S. treasuries, literally the government stops funding itself immediately, almost. I mean, the forget about Congress passing right. a budget. Yeah, right. Forget about this is literally how the money flows. I don't know how. I'm not, you know, I'm not on the business side, but because I learned in that moment, we're in a oh, you know what situation. I learned about it kind of interestingly through the trusted sharing networks. We had a member of a very large clearinghouse call and said, the four most dreaded words in the financial sector, I cannot clear trades. The only thing we do in the financial sector is trade and exchange money. That's it. If you can't trade and exchange money, you are in big trouble. 
And I've only heard that twice. It was Ion Financial and ICBC. Both, nobody had heard of these things. Like all of a sudden first heard for like 99% of the people in the sector. But because of that trusted relationship, I said, I got to tell the government immediately. I have to call the U.S. Treasury. This is, this is not good. And he gave me the permission to call Treasury anonymously. And I could say that it was a clearinghouse. I mean, that was kind of a funny conversation too, because so I called Treasury. We have a, we have a, a trusted person we call. We, we know them, you know, who we call in an incident. You know, and I said a clearinghouse. And, and you know, immediately the assistant director says, well, what clearinghouse? I was like, does it matter? There's like five. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and they're all systemically critically important. Does it really matter? Uh, so, but anyway, and immediately they start their processes uh, contact the regulators, make sure, you know, in that case, you want the regulators to get in there and start poking around and see what's, what's going on. So that, but that initial, uh, we were able to operate with information superiority in this, in this particular incident, because we were alerted by a member so quickly. And part of what we also kind of skipped over earlier is how we we're able to share information with the ISAC between member, member, government, and you guys are able to coalesce all of that information to one big picture for the rest of us. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in that particular uh, situation, we immediately spin up a channel um, at TLP Red or Amber. We, we, do, we do both. TLP Red for firms that are directly impacted by the incident. Again, like we, you, those concentric circles of sharing to promote trust. TLP Red, you're directly impacted. You get your own channel. TLP Amber, folks that are kind of they're, they're going to be impacted in this sector, but it's not gonna be that direct immediate impact of not being able to clear trades. So we do that immediately. And then I'll pass it to Sydney about what she what she gains once she gets into those right. like, channels. So um, more in the last couple of months, we've had a lot of these channels as we've discussed and <laughs> it's been fun. Um, so some of the things that we're able to do is learn what others firms are seeing and able to kind of report that back to my leadership. You know, they're, they're stressing about is our data at at risk, was our data exposed? Don't know, still trying to figure it out, but none of the other banks know either. So we're, we're in that same boat. We're, we're not kind of out there on our own. We're all together. We're all finding out what we can together. You know, someone sees something exposed online on a data link site, they're putting it in that channel so that everyone sees it. We're not all having to do the same research at the same time. Someone finds it before the rest of us, they tell everyone else and we're able to kind of work that together. Um, so it's kind of just, it's not like having your own MSSP basically, but it is kind of in a way of just like, hey, somebody else saw this, so we're able to get that information sooner. You know, we've been on sector-wide calls where they're able to provide information directly to us from the victim through, you know, another service through FSI SAC or SIFMA, which is another acronym of something in the financial sector, and just kind of says, this is what the victim has seen. This is what they're working on. They're working with a forensics team. They're working on at an attestation when they get back online so that they can hopefully reconnect with you all and just kind of providing that information to everyone at once versus having 500 calls or having one call with 500 people on them. And these channels really spin up with these sort of crowdsourced, firm sourced um, questions. Some really good lessons learned that we have to think about moving forward because we're, we're definitely past the point uh, we we need to expect disruption from ransomware and from many other um, hazards as well, but from ransomware in the financial community. And one thing that we've really discovered in the past several incidents, um, kind of interesting thing for you all to think about too, like if there had been contagion and if the ransomware had gone to multiple firms, how many IR firms out there are there really, yeah. right? And how many are offering like a premium service where you pay and you know because in two cases there are IR firms we've never heard of that are doing incident response for these very critical firms and so that's generating a lot of discussion do you trust an attestation from an IR firm you'd never heard of right um does your firm have a plan if multiple people in your sector get hammered at the same time you know I'm not going to say the big one we're all thinking of, but they're probably going to be busy. <laughs> yeah. So then what do you do? And these are the kind of things these channels get you thinking about prior to an actual incident. 
And even thinking in business resiliency terms, you know, the return to operations were exceeding what anyone had kind of exercised for, honestly. In my knowledge, like usually it was like, oh, we'll be back in like two, three days. We're talking like weeks, months being down, not, you know, doing more things manually, or they might go to another vendor. So, you know, in one case, be like, well, this vendor hasn't come back up. So we're going to switch somewhere else because our team's been working manually. So other things to kind of consider as well outside of the cyberspace. And that's been another huge lesson learned for me um, is also, and you know, I, I work cyber threat intelligence. Um, these functions in these three cases that caused significant, I don't want to say significant disruption because the impact was minimal. We addressed it and we moved on. We did what we had to do to be resilient, but it made us all think. And one of the things we thought about is the business side and the security side probably need to talk a little bit more because these are software that the security side might have known, okay, it's on the network, but didn't understand the centrality that this piece of software had into the function of the whole sector. And I, you know, and I, you know, Sydney was talking to a trader, if you want to, um, everything's become so automated these days and there are all these algorithms running in the background and do these, does the business side know how to go to a manual process? Especially when all, we were talking yeah. about this, so many traders are in their 20s. When was the last time they did anything manually? I mean, Liz and I are a bit older, but yeah. like, we, I remember our first like BCP plans like 15 years ago being like, oh, we'll just do it manually. Like everyone knows how to do that. I don't know if traders nowadays know how to go back to manually so quickly because they've been in algo training for, I don't know how many years now. So it's just like thinking back to like, oh, they're doing manual trading and clearing and reconciliation. Well, how many mistakes are going to happen there? What's going to make sure that that money is actually equalizing? Is it being reported to the regulators on time? Is it going to be true, et cetera? Right. Because until, in, in what I can see for a lot of folks, um, until this year, like going to manual trading sort of theoretical, right? Well, you know, we'll go to manual trading. And everyone's like, check, check, check. Yeah, manual trading, manual trading. You know, but then they go, and as I, I'm going to say something, I probably should. But um, one of my my colleagues who, who's been on Wall Street for a really long time, he says these young traders don't even know how to make a phone call. Um, so he's like, do they know how to trade at the volume to keep up with the volume that they normally trade with these algorithms? Because they're going to have to keep up with the trading volume. And these are all things we, you know, prior to this, you're like, check, yep, yep, got it, manual. And now we really realize we got to go back to the business side. Probably all of us in this room think we need to go back to our business side and find out what really is that pivotal piece or that pivotal algorithm you need to make this whole thing work out. So, And, and one other thing I would suggest is going back and looking at your critical vendors list, because we all have our list of like what's most yep. critical, what's somewhat critical, what could happen and nothing would happen. Well, like I said, none of us had heard of these three firms and how much impact has that had on the sector this year. And that's another thing we've learned too is, you know, because you can't stop trading, you really have to keep going. You're going to have to go to another vendor. Having them pre-vetted is really important too, right? You can have identified who you might want to go to, but you're going to have to pre-vet them um, as well. And so that's another thing to think about is, is, as you go through um, as your process. And these are all things that your trusted sharing community can help you think through. I didn't come up with anything that I'm saying right now. All of this came from crowdsource information on our FSI SAC platform of firms that are thinking through these problems um, creatively, really good creative problem solving so that me as an individual or Sydney as an individual or her firm as an individual firm doesn't have to come up with all of these answers and thoughts we can we can come up with it together so i feel like we beat that pretty well yeah <laughs> we were gonna ptsd over here <laughs> we're still in the middle of an incident yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in summary um basically you know like we said please establish relationships with your ISACs and ISOWs, um, you know, develop those trusted relationships with your peers. Uh, we talked about a lot of stuff that goes beyond cyber threat intelligence, but that is still going to be something that you should 
either expected to start learning about or start thinking about for your own firm? Like, what is it that your business does and what are some things about your business that they do to survive that you might not know so that you can start digging into that as well? Um, and then create those information sharing processes, start sharing some data. And I don't know if you want to do the last one. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. And participation ensures our collective security. And one thing I want to emphasize, too, is in person is really, really important when you're establishing the trust relationships. You really got to look them in the eye, you know, because you're making yourself vulnerable. You have to talk about what your firm is observing and you're observing things that um, or you're observing incidents you may have had that that that, you know, normally we don't like to talk about. So you're talking about things that are, you know, your firm is vulnerable in those moments. So it really helps to have that in person. I saw you, I know you in the eye um, to get to the point where you're sharing the kind of IOCs that you want to, that you want to have your hands on. Yep. And we'd love to take any questions. Um, or if you have suggestions, things that work for you as well, please. <clears throat> Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Slack kicked me off my phone so I get to carry the laptop, but it's good. So I'm going to get my exercise in for today because um, we do have a lot of great questions in the chat, but also uh, probably in the room. So if you have questions in the room, oh, I see one in the back right there. Um, we will go we'll kick it off. Yeah, you've got, we got a lot, a lot of questions for y'all. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm a social behavioral scientist and think a lot about trust collaboration and I uh, have worked in, in government on research in cyber. And I'm curious what you see as working and would recommend in terms of really the put on your own oxygen mask first that we have to build trust within our, our teams and within our organizations. Um, I would appreciate if you could speak a little bit more to, you know, building that within so that there, there's a microcosm or a role model of what can happen beyond your your own organization. I can start. Yeah, because this is really, you know, about the firms right. having to get comfortable. Yeah, um, so my last firm, I, I kind of started off before we went to the external sharing part, just kind of talking internally, getting to know the business side of things, talking to the rest of the cyber defense teams, um, kind of explaining what Intel does, and kind of talking to them, like, what are your needs? Here's how we could help you. And then we have this great external sharing partner that we could start using, you know, when you all are ready. Um, and then at my current firm, I kind of did the reverse just because I already had these external partnerships. And so I've kind of been like, hey, I, since I already have these trusted peers, here's what I'm getting from them. It's kind of bringing it back internally and then circling it around. So I, I've done it both ways. I, I find the organic internal better just because that, that's who you're working for. So maybe, you know, start those discussions internally first. And just quickly, um, I have a previous life. I worked for the CIA. And honestly, since I've taken this job, I consider myself a case officer running an elaborate source network. I mean, truly. <laughs> I, and I'm using game theory uh, to, to get people to, to share. Awesome. I will also say our call for papers opens in the fall. So if you're interested in sharing any of your findings, um, behavioral therapy next year, we'll, we'll be looking out for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, what do you suggest for organizations that cannot afford membership in an ISAC? We know a lot of organizations, Rick put it well, uh, they're living below the security poverty line and they just don't have funds in their budget. What do you recommend in those instances? I recommend that they reach out to their, um, their sector ISAC anyway. We have uh, a kind of sliding scale on our members, but also we publish on purpose white papers so that anyone can access them. Uh, and a fun fact, we usually get our very large um, Bank of Goliath technical writers to write our white papers deliberately to distill it down to the, the for the small, medium community institutions. And anyone can access it. We have um, things about sc Scattered Spider, we have Lockbit and their white papers on our FSI SAC website specifically for folks that maybe living below the poverty line. <laughs> All right, uh, any in the room? All right. So with, um, with the amount of sharing, how do ISACs mitigate the detriments of circular reporting or false positives? Oh, that's a good one. No, we have that, yeah. Um, I, I caveat things um, with the fog of war, right? And I try to say, you know what? We're in initial phases of an incident, some of this is unvetted, un, un, you know, 
take it with a grain of salt and then clean it up later. But we do get, it happens, but we do try to caveat it in the very beginning. This is not vetted. You're going to have to do some, some vetting um, of the, of the IOCs and things that people put in the channel. Awesome. Um, so how important are sharing agreements between organizations? I, I'm, I'm assuming this means within an ISAC. I would say they're extremely important. Um, you know, that's another thing that would get your lawyers on board is to kind of share that there are NDAs in place or are sharing inf arrangements in place to protect your information. Um, so make sure that you also kind of highlight that, that as well. Uh, we've got a question. Um, this might be better answered, actually, now that I'm mentioning it, when you sit back down. Um, but we've got some interest and resources on using game theory in situations like this. <laughs> so if you have any off the top of your head, feel free. But that might be a good just follow up. Um, what would you say are the top two or three ways to maximize your time and money investment in an ISAC? For, for me, I would say it's those smaller communities, um, you know, find the communities, at least within the FSI sect, we, we have one specifically for the securities group that we can talk to, or there's one specifically for clearing houses and exchanges, there's some for ri uh, sorry, real estate and insurance, you know, finding those niche subsector groups are very helpful. Um, and then those, those usually have intelligence specifically for your area. So that will kind of help you weed through all the noise of the larger indicators that the FSI SAC is sharing. I would say the same, find your community of interest. If you're a vulnerability, man you, you know, vulnerability management, it, whether it's topic or um, your subsector, whatever is going to, you think is gonna benefit you. Awesome, um, actually, I love this question. Uh, so for folks that are members of an ISAC but don't know what to share or aren't active sharers, what type of information sharing leads to the most actionable intelligence that helps other organizations? We have a what to share um, paper and I can see, I put it in the Slack channel. It's, it's we basically uh, have, have it, you know, written out, like if you're going to share DDoS, you know, share, you know, share these things. If you're going to share this kind of malware, share, you know, we have it all listed out to try to take the guesswork out. Very cool. Um, and how much of the intel sharing is lower level indicators versus um, kind of more higher level or strategic types of sharing? I think it starts with the lower level stuff and people are more comfortable with that and they'll share more of the lower level stuff in the larger, that's why I call the concentric circles of sharing and the larger uh, circles and then they share more as the communities of interest are locked down. So um, for clearing houses exchanges during ICBC, we locked down that community and it was just TLP red. So that, so that they could share, you know, actually what they were doing to mitigate. So that's why we offer sort of this concentric kind of walk you to the bullseye sort of um, sharing process. Awesome. We have a, a couple more questions in Slack. We're almost out of time over here. Um, but I just, again, make sure if you're in the room, I can't really see very well from the stage, but raise your hand. We've got folks in the back who can run over. Um, the reason they have those lightsaber things is because I can actually see those. So please feel free to raise your hand high. Um, but from online, um, is it necessary to have sharing agreements with law enforcement or government agencies, or is that kind of handled by being part of the ISAC? We do. The ISAC does. Um, I have a uh... TSSCI, so I can go into CISA, Treasury, wherever I need to go. Um, I find that to be less helpful because then I can't share anything after I go in and get a briefing. Um, I also think we can use, oh, that fella's uh, OSINT um, platform. Like that's going to get you the TSSCI information you need. You know what I mean? Like if we're all being honest with ourselves. Okay? <laughs> Someone may have made a comment about that in the chat earlier. <laughs> right. I mean, so so I do have these sharing agreements and um, they're beneficial to establish trust. So we know to work with each other in an incident. But in terms of information sharing, I'd rather just use unclassified information and I, I would say, you know, if you are a larger firm or you're worried about potentially having an incident, it's best to know your law enforcement yep. now before there's ever an incident. So I, I do have close relationships with my local FBI and Secret Service agents, um, not as much with DHS. I usually use FSISAC for Treasury myself, um, but other firms do have direct relationships. 
Um, and it's still sharing at the unclassified level, potentially classified, but it's still having those relationships is good now so that when your lawyers come to you later about what happened, we already have those relationships. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing your experiences. Thank you.